Get it going. All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another session of Survey Talk. My name is Josh Brewer, representing the Nashville Grotto and the Cartographic Section. Uh, we've been doing a series of survey talks, and tonight we have our first guest. Uh, Adam Hugh is going to be talking about underwater cave survey for us. Uh, and our next meeting, two weeks from now, we'll pick back up with uh, beginning sketching. Uh, so I'm going to let Adam take it away. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. Um, hey, everybody. I am going to talk to you guys tonight about underwater cave survey. Um, I wasn't exactly sure how to structure this presentation. I don't usually do these. So I'm just going to kind of go loosely through it. If anyone has any questions, just feel free to chime in and ask. Um, I'm, I'm gearing it more towards uh, the dry cavers and, and trying to differentiate the practices between dry cave survey and wet cave survey. Um, but I also know there are some, some cave divers here. So if I need to get technical, um, just let me know if I need to go one way or another. Um, so looking through my information I have here, I, I have probably about 10 hours of info, but I'm going to try to talk for 20 minutes. So you might see me breeze through some slides and if you need me to go back, just feel free to let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to kind of go at my own pace. Um, at first, I, I was going to try to get into the history of, of uh, underwater cave survey and why we are where we're at right now. Um, you can't get anywhere in talking about the history of cave diving without talking about this man right here. Um, you know, we, we owe him everything for, for how we dive and up until how we survey. But that's kind of boring, so I was going to kind of skip past that. But there is one person I wanted to talk about in regards to the history of underwater cave survey, and that's my mentor, Jason Richards. Um, he's done a lot for the sport. Uh, he's done a lot for me in particular. Um, he's taught me a lot of things. Um, and one of the most important things he taught me that took me years to really comprehend was uh, there's no such thing, no, no such thing as a bad caveman. Um, so there are many, many cartographers out there and surveyors out there that are willing to knock down others to, I think, make themselves feel better, very rare instances, rare instances to help them. But um, I've, I, it took me a long time to realize this. There's no such thing as a bad cave map, especially when it comes to underwater cave mapping, because there are so few of them that at this point, we'll take what we can get. Um, so I, I believe in this wholeheartedly for, for a very long time. And this was my fundamental uh, core thinking up until recently, until I saw one map that is indeed a bad cave map. And it's this one. So there is one bad cave map out there. And I don't mean to bring this up to uh, shame any cartographers that were associated with this project, but this kind of goes round robin back to what I was talking about with Jason about how he's, Jason is responsible for, I guess, bridging the gap between decades of very poor cave mapping in the cave diving community to getting us up to speed to where the dry cavers are. And what I mean by that is the use of standardized symbols, uh, you know, consistency between one team to the next. Up until recently, I mean, this is, this is kind of the best, this is the best we had. I mean, there's just maps that didn't really make sense to anyone outside of the immediate group or to anyone drawing them. Um, they were almost cartoony. And in many instances, these are the only maps, especially this one right here of Little River. Um, this was the only usable map for many years. And it's kind of the reason why I, I redid the map, just because I was tired of staring at this one. And once I got into it, I realized that this map is actually really accurate, but everyone assumes it's not because of the structure and the, the way it was drawn. Um, so Jason, you know, there are many people that came through the cave diving mapping world and influenced it. But I think Jason did a great job in getting us to adopt standardized symbols. So we could actually have maps that make sense to people other than cave divers or other than the people that were actually making them. And we don't have to deal with this. Um, so, and the reason why it's taken us this long to really get beyond this point and kind of catch up to where the dry cavers were is because one of the fundamental concepts or differences between 
in my opinion, between cave divers and uh, dry cavers are the fact that cave divers are not inherently cavers, they're divers who just happen to be inside caves. So for that reason, there's, there's very little motivation for structured, organized mapping projects. Um, usually most of the maps that come out are an afterthought and they're secondary or tertiary to the primary task at hand. Um, in fact, many, many reasons for maps are, are just to an ends to a mean and, and means to an end to get access to places. Um, many people start taking up cartography just so they can have something to legitimize their work to get them onto properties. Um, I don't know how it is in the dry caving community, but 90% of the underwater caves are shut down because at some point over the last 30 or 40 years, someone died. And there's really no incentive for uh, a landowner to let you get on there. So the very few avenues you have to take to be able to get access to, to go on a dive is to legitimize your work and actually start working and making maps. And I mean, it's, I've seen people just make up maps just for the sake of getting in. It's, it's highly unethical and it drives me nuts, but it, it happens. And this is kind of an example of my first map. This is my first map, Edwards. Um, this was, Jason considered this an abomination. Uh, I've made this for the sole reason of getting access to the property. Um, I approached the landowner and asked him to dive. He said no. And we just got to talking and he showed me a map that he had of the place and it was very rudimentary as a stick map. And um, I told him I could do better, even though I had no idea how. I'd never made any maps before. I just was bluffing to try to get him to let me in. And he said, okay. And I said, oh shoot, so I gotta make up something. So I went and dove it, had a fun dive, came up and spent 10 minutes drawing this. And he thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And uh, it really, that was when I really realized that there is a value in it outside of just us cavers, there are uh, individuals and governmental agencies that actually find this stuff useful. And so that was the point, I've been diving at that point up for, for probably about 15, 20 years. And that was the first time that I really saw a way to legitimize what I was doing and, and just kind of took off from there. So within about a year or two, I was making real maps. This was the first real map I made a jug hole. Jason helped me make this map. It was the first map I actually published and printed. So back to what I was saying earlier, what is the, the, I was, when approaching this, this presentation, I was trying to decide the, the route that I want to go. And I wanted to, since I assumed I was talking to mostly dry cavers, I thought it'd be neat to point out what I saw was the differences between dry cave mapping and wet cave mapping. And um, even though there are literally thousands and infinite different things that are different between the two. There's one fundamental concept that I've seen across the board that really dictates how one exploration group approaches it over the other, and that is time. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I know dry cavers have time, you know, they're in the cave for, an, you know, a finite amount of time, and they're trying to collect information just like everyone else, but I feel like that problem is compounded underwater because you're, you know, you're, you have a finite amount of gas to breathe. It's a, it's a very limited amount of time. So what I've found is over time, people are more willing to take quantity over quality. They're more concerned about grabbing as much data out of a cave than getting the most precise, accurate information. Um, one way I like to describe this, I like to, I like to describe, um, you know, how I picture, I've never actually been in a dry cave before, so I'm probably, you know, just, over exaggerating in my head, but I've, I assume that mapping dry caves is like flying an airplane, like a Cessna or something over a town. And while flying and trying to do the things you normally fly, you're also drawing and sketching and, and taking them out of, you know, doing the things you need to do to not only not crash the plane, but to draw, but then to map underwater caves would be like jumping out of the plane and then trying to draw what you see underneath you before you have to deploy your parachute. And so, with that mentality, you are willing to accept a less accurate survey in, in exchange for more. And there are, I'd say the vast majority of underwater cave surveyors and cartographers would disagree with me on that. They would say we, we have to get just as good survey 
as them dry cavers. Um, to which I say, I would take anything at this point over nothing. I mean, for, for every, 100 cave, every 100 caves we have here in Florida, only one has a survey and far less than that have an actual map. So, you know, what, what I like perfect survey, what I like to see it, what everyone like to see it, of course, but I've been doing this for about six years now and I've, I've realized that if you're there, take it while you can get it because a lot of these places you can only get in once every 10 years or so. So an, a, an expression I coined that not necessarily everyone agrees now, not speaking on behalf of all cave dive, cave, di cave diver mappers is, doesn't matter how well you survey, it matters how well you survey fast. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, there are a, a core group of people out there that are making these hyper uber realistic maps by themselves and, and they're great and they're spectacular and they're, they're worthy of hanging on, on your wall and they're great and they take years to make and I have nothing but respect. But when it comes to actually partaking in an exploration team or an expedition, when you're working with people who nine out of the 10 people there don't give a rat's ass about making a survey or map where you're where your task is secondary or tertiary to exploration, where you'd be lucky to get out of there with survey, your quantity is much highly regard, higher regarded than the quality. But with that said, you don't want to make an obvious blunder because then once they find it, then you're out. They'll, they'll never let you back in. So it's, it's a delicate balance. It's a fine line you got to watch, walk. But what I've seen is between the dry cavers and the wet cavers, the dry cavers are willing to spend a little bit more extra time in the cave to get the more accurate data that it's not even a possibility sometimes when you're when you're pushing your gas reserves right up until the end. So a good example of this is this picture I saw recently of a dry cave survey team using something called a distro to measure the distance between rocks. And I don't know if this is what you guys have enough time to do, but we, we don't have enough time to do this measure the distance between rocks. In fact, we, we usually don't even draw rocks. Um, when, I'm, when I'm sketching, I don't, even, I don't even have the time to draw a rock. I just, I draw the word rocks in areas that are rocks and I go back and try to remember from memory what they look like. So I know this is satire and I know this is supposed to be comical. I doubt all you cave dry cavers are doing this, but it's, I know, it kind of struck a chord with some of us wet cavers and the, the differences between the two. Um, and which leads me to the next point. Uh, I keep hearing about all these things called distros. I don't know what they are. Um, I think if you ask any wet caver what a distro is, you couldn't get an answer out of any of them. Apparently there are these magical machines that map caves for you. They sound amazing. Um, I've never seen one in real life. I don't even know if they exist, but whatever. Um, so I was going to spend some time talking about the instruments that we use that are different from y'all, that what I think is different. But looking at how much time I had, it's probably best to skip that. Um, most of them are probably the same electronic compasses versus base plate compasses, uh, dive slates versus wet notes. Um, one, one big difference that I've seen between dry cavers and wet cavers is we use we predominantly use knotted line. Well, not line in 10 foot increments. And that serves two purposes. Uh, the line stays in the cave permanently. That's our guideline out. Um, I guess you dry cavers just remember how to get out. Uh, we don't. So we have to leave line in with arrows pointing towards the exit. And what's nice is you can knot that line and that serves as a survey. And so you can also leave survey stations on it. It's actually pretty handy compared to what I've seen in dry caves where you're leaving tape and stuff places. Um, that would never last. Where but we also use. So, sorry, I was just wondering, what are you using for like left, right, up, downs? Uh, yes. So what's nice? So if it depends, if you're if if you're willing to get a high degree of accuracy, uh, get your depth gauge, put it on the ceiling or the floor. You can get up and down. Um, but a lot of times, just guessing left or right. But what I would recommend to anyone who is trying to get more accurate over just better than nothing data is to actually tape measure it for the first little while. And you'll actually realize that your perception of distances underwater are way different than 
what you think because of refraction or whatever. So what you think is 10 feet away is actually 20 feet away or eight or five feet away. So um, for the first little while, when I was really trying to teach myself what's the easiest way to do this, the most efficient way I was tape measuring. Now, if you're in a cave with poor visibility and you can't see anything, you have to tape measure or you just make the call to not take a left, right. And that's why you see so many stick maps because you have these caves that are 50 feet wide with 10 foot of visibility. And they're just trying to get as much data as they, they're trying to explore. They don't care about walls. So in a perfect world, you would tape measure it. You would tie off the line, swim over, but that eats up time. You rack up deco and you're going to come out of the cave with 300 to 400 feet of survey as opposed to a thousand feet. And for a project that you're lucky to get something out of once every two or three years. So is left, right, up, down important? I think it is in making a, a map, like an actual map, but in terms of survey and what we're talking about here and the exploration groups, they're not going to really, they're going to want it. I mean, they would like it, but it's not essential. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the, I've seen other things come into play. Um, some of the karst underwater research guys, they're constantly trying to improve the process and reinvent the wheel. Um, Matt, can started using these aqua sketch scrolling wrist slate things. They seem really cool on paper and I tried using them, but I just, I couldn't get used to it. Um, there were people out there using fancy video rendering software where they were taking high definition footage and then dumping it into a computer and then it was somehow making it work. Um, and I think that kind of takes all the fun out of it. That's kind of like away from the pure stuff. And then there are people out there using lasers and stuff. Um, I've never had much luck with that. I think people just like the idea of using lasers in caves. I, I, maybe it works for them, it's never worked for me. There has been uh, an influx of, of newer technology though, in terms of telemetry, which I've actually seen surprisingly good results from. Um, this is one example from Seacraft, and this is one of two that I'm aware of. One is SUEX where it uses a telemetry to actually vaguely guess the direction you're going for the duration that you're going in, in, the, in, the, in one of them, a 3D realm based on depth, on a depth gauge. And way, the way it does it, it has like this impeller that you put on the front of a scooter. And as long as you're moving at a steady rate, the water moving past it, you can tell the computer how fast you're moving based on the direction you're going. And then it plots it all, makes it a map. And, to be honest, the whole idea sounded like horseshit, but then when I started seeing it come out, it was actually really accurate. Um, and what I what I think is probably the future of underwater cave mapping, which is actually moving away from accuracy, but more towards um, quantity. So here's an example of that side by side. So here's here's Andy Pitkin's survey of Morgan Spring using a Seacraft ENC2. And underneath that is my survey of Chaplin using a traditional base plate compass and knots and a tape measure. And so Andy collected his data in one dive, and it wasn't even an exploration dive. In fact, it was the very first dive the team had ever done in the system where survey and getting any information whatsoever was so far of an afterthought. The fact that they even decided to bring this is, is amazing, actually, because they were just going to see if the cave was still there and if it was diveable. To get survey out was probably number 20 on their list of things to do that day. But he just said, hey, I have nothing, you know, it's there. It's not getting in the way. I'll just tack it on. We'll see how it ends up. He came out, plotted the data, and we had we had a line plot prior to that and it dropped almost right on top of it. It was really surprising. And so he basically gathered data for a portion of cave that took 20 years to survey in a cave that goes out a couple miles that we do not have survey information for. But there's all sorts of rumors flowing around out there that it goes 5,000, 7,000, 8,000, 10,000, all these questions out there about this cave that could all be easily answered with a survey. But since there's no survey, it's more, more folklore than anything else. So he was able to grab a lot of information in a relatively painless, easy amount of time. So compared to the South Cave on the southern end of the property, I was surveying with a tape measure and a base plate compass over the course of many weeks. And this is about the same amount of survey data compared comparatively distance wise and it looks about the same i mean the mine is way more accurate obviously because i took the time to do it i was moving at about an eighth the pace andy was my dives were geared towards collecting survey i was shallow um, he was working in the depths of 170 foot i was working in six, 40 to 60 foot range so i didn't have to worry about deco 
So I, I gathered this, this high grade, uber accurate, comprehensive survey of the entire upper level and put them side by side. And you ask yourself, you know, is it better to have a more accurate survey or a more complete survey, you know? And the, and the people that it matters that are, that are interpreting this information, they would say it doesn't matter um, because they're scientists. The people that it really matters to the landowners, they don't really care about the accuracy. So it's just, it's something interesting to think about. I think the idea of using a base plate compass and, and nodding system will never go away because it's, it's pure, it's, it's an art form. But I think when it comes to actually gathering information for the sake of being efficient and quantifying your work, the electronic telemetry is the direction that I see the sport going. Um, so with that said, since, you know, since the whole theme of this presentation was to kind of tell the difference between dry cavers and, and wet cavers and the reasons why there are differences, mostly because there's zero motivation and they're not there to go caving, they're there to go diving. Um, it is important to respect all uh, teammates, um, regardless of the quality of data coming up. Because at the end of the day, I mean, if, if there are dry or if there are cave divers listening right now, I would say up and down that the, the quality needs to be there just as much as dry cavers. But at the end of the day, there's so few people coming out of caves with data that even if it was horse crap, it's still better than nothing. I mean, other than that one map I showed you. Again. So, it's really important to respect all your teammates, including the very special ones, like our friend Eric. Um, this is a set of survey notes that came out of a cave recently that, that one of our teammates did that had an azimuth heading that, that wasn't physically possible. And he got roasted for it. And I thought this was a good learning opportunity for not only the people on the team, but the people who are getting interested in cave mapping that would see this as like a barrier of entry of, of it being too hard or if it, you know, being discouraged to do it. Um, you know, here we have a cave where, you know, it's taken years and the access to this cave is almost uh, non-existent. Um, you have to rappel down into it. So you have to have, you have to have the dry caving skills to get into it. Um, which is very limiting. I couldn't get into this cave. And so there's so many things working against it. And by the time you have the core group of people that are even capable of doing this or interested in doing it, almost none of them want to actually survey. So the fact that survey came out of here was amazing. And this is kind of what we were looking at. And so this is, I, I wouldn't like to say this is what you should expect from a, a wet caving team. But I mean, I guess the point I'm trying to make is this is actually this little survey note here was probably some of the most important survey information our team has seen in a very long time. So, and it has an azimuth reading of 364. So, who the hell knows? But we know the general direction the cave is going, which is actually all we care about. So, um, I think my time. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Why exactly was that one cave map so terrible? Well, because it's hard to read, in my opinion. I think, I mean, I remember the first time I saw this, I couldn't even tell where the entrance was. And, and it looks like a cartoon, and I think that, you know, I go back and forth on this when I say, well, it's a map and it exists, so it's better than nothing. But in some cases, um, there were symbols that were just kind of made up and it was, it was so far from the standard, standardized way of making maps that to think that this, this would be okay to do on a regular basis, I guess this was kind of all tied into Jason kind of bringing us away from this, this mindset that we should start adopting the generalized way of doing things with, with composing and, and white space and symbols and stuff. And I've, I've never been, this is the very first time I ever felt compelled to call a map bad. And it's just because there's so many needless things on it that would confuse somebody that was maybe trying to get into maps. I don't know. I just, 
I, I couldn't stand this. It just this map just seemed like a nails on a chalkboard for me, just because there were so many made up things on it. It it does kind of seem like it's maybe a blend between a profile and an overhead view at certain spots. Yeah, and what's what's crazy is so I I remapped this system. I spent two years doing it. Spent about four hundred hours, and as I started comparing my real map to this, it's actually really accurate. Like not only with the distances, which are completely, this was not a survey. This was, she's just drawing from memory. And um, now I talked to the guy who made this map. He's like, I didn't survey anything. I didn't sketch anything. It was all from memory. And this, this map wasn't made for anybody but himself. He made this for himself because he was trying to interpret the cave. There's passages going everywhere, passages going over passages, coming out on top of passages. And when you go in there, it doesn't make sense that you go left in a passage and come in on the right side it's because the passage was over. So he's trying to make sense of it all. And he's drawing it out and he's the only one making a map of the place. So when people see it, say, oh, hey, that's the, that's the map. And it's like, no, that's not, I mean, it's like we could do, we could do better. Than that. So it's kind of like, it's just its own language that um, was so far from the standard adopted cartographic way of doing things that it's the furthest example I can think of, if that makes any sense. Hey, yeah. Did you did you ultimately get to share that completed map that you did with this person that mapped the cave? Um, I did actually. So the individual, so I feel bad talking about him. He's, he's a great guy. And I told him that I used his map as an example. Um, he, he's out of diving now. So it's, I feel bad talking trash about people who can't get back in the water and redeem themselves. He's flying drones right now for professionally. And I showed it to him and he was like, that's when he kind of told me, he's like, man, I, I wasn't, and he's right. I mean, he, he wasn't making this map for anybody. He was making it for himself. He was trying to interpret the cave in the way that he saw it. It wasn't, it wasn't meant for anybody but himself and where he would, he could tell where to go in a cave. And um, since it was really the only rendering of the cave, the dive shops start offering the money for it. He started producing it and then it was considered the map. And it was, um, and it wasn't meant for that. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he's cool with me talking shit about it. That's what you're asking. Hey, Adam. Yeah. Uh, I think, I don't think I'd let you get out of here without explaining to the group very simply the process of how you guys set stations, like just run through, you know, what, what you do very simply if you can. So, um, so in, in underwater caves, there's, we use guidelines to, uh, find our way out. Um, so every passage has a permanent, usually a permanent line, in it, and there's there's theory as to how that should be run, where the line should be gapped between side passages, coming out to the entrance. That's a whole other topic entirely. But basically, for the vast majority of the case system, there's going to be a, a guideline system in it with little plastic arrows pointing towards the exit. So in the event you get to it, it's a complete silt out. You can't see anything. Complete lights out. No visibility. You could feel your way out. And since you have a finite amount of gas, you usually have about 30 minutes to get out when something really bad happens. Nice thing about that guideline is it usually hugs the walls and it follows the direction of the natural cave unless you do excess amount of tiles. So if you just let the guideline do its thing, it's going to naturally follow the path of the cave. So you use that to survey. And so if you knot that line every 10 feet, let's say you come up to a survey and there's a start of the line. You take a compass, like a base plate Sunto compass or a digital sea bear compass or whatever you can use, and you hold it up parallel to the line. That's your azimuth. And you record the azimuth, record the depth. And since we are underwater, I know you guys use inclinometers or those little things you put up to your eyeballs and that. Those don't work underwater. So what we have to do is we have to use a depth gauge. And so our, our, so our, our grades of maps can never be as accurate as a dry cave because the depth gauge is from one foot to the next. And that's no, and not anywhere near as accurate as it doesn't matter. I mean, over the course of a couple miles, we're talking a few feet here, it doesn't matter, um, at least in our world. But anyway, so you take the depth recording of that station and you count the knots and then you count the, I guess, whatever distances after that last knot to the next. And let's say you count three knots and then it's three feet past that knot. To the next station when the line touches, like basically when the line touches anything, a wall or it's tied off on a rock. And you say that shot is 33 feet long 
at this heading from, from 64 feet depth to 65 feet depth. And so now you have your 3D shot. You have a shot from, you have inclination based on one depth to another. It's negative one foot. You have an azimuth and then you have the distance. And then at that station, you record left, right, up, down, and then just repeat and plot it in the software afterwards. Very cool. I know that uh, we had some questions on the chat about the actual process. Uh, let me see if there's anything else coming through here. What software do you use, Adam? I use Compass. Um, that's predominantly what most of the big teams are using. Um, from what I'm aware of, 99% of the mappers out there are using either Compass or Walls. And of those people, the vast majority are using Compass. I think the people who are still using Walls are just holdouts because they're either dry cavers and that's what they're used to. Um, but the people who are getting into it are strongly encouraged by almost every exploration team, including ours, to, to start with Compass. Um, just because um, there's a lot more features in there that are that are beneficial to underwater survey. Larry Fish is, is the smartest man on earth and, and he's still keeping up with it and, and adding stuff to, to make it very useful. So I don't, from what I've never used walls, but from what I gather, it's not staying up at the same rate as that. So our, our team is Karst Underwater Research. And if if you were to come to us with a compiled data, data set and walls, we would probably not even accept it. We would say, convert this to data or something. Um, for a while, they were using OnStation, um, CDI files, which are nice because they can convert to Excel and you can just bring them back into Compass. But we really try to stay with Compass just because it's, it seems to be the universal format amongst various exploration groups. And it's also essential if you want to start sketching and drawing stuff. Do, uh, do you sketch as you're taking shots or do you come back, is that a, you sketch while you go like dry cavers is the question. So no, um, the, well, sometimes. So typically the general process is you would, you would survey and then you would go home and plot on compass and you would print that out on the waterproof paper, duct tape it to a big clipboard. And then you go into cave and you sketch around the plot. Um, however, there are times where you have one shot in a cave and you get to the end of the cave and you have plenty of time left. And you're like, I need to start sketching. So then you, you learn how to plot quickly. So you'll, you'll do the survey in, turn over on a piece of graph paper and get your little protractor out and sketch and try to very rough plot like underwater in a matter of minutes and then sketch on your way out. And it's a very rough sketch. I mean, it's not even a drawing. It's just you leaving yourself notes. It's like literally the words rock here or pit or this or that. And it's because it's literally when you're doing that type of mapping, it's because you know you're never going to be able to get back in that cave ever again. Or the, the possibility of getting back in there, the likelihood of getting back in there is, is very slim. So you just want to get something and you want to make use of your time. You have nothing left to survey. But generally, you would try to get a high, higher degree of survey, plot it out, bring it in the cave and sketch around the survey. And what's nice is since the, since the cave lines are permanent, your survey, your, your, your survey is the line. It's still there. It's the same line unless someone messes around with it. So it's it's really convenient to have a line in, in the cave when it comes to surveying. Very cool. Does anyone else have any questions for Adam? I've always wondered something about the guideline. I know you know cave diving can be quite dangerous, especially if, you know, silt gets everywhere and visibility goes out. And you hear, I've read about so many horror stories of people losing the line and, you know, sometimes dying because of it. I just wondered why don't cave divers or do cave divers actually clip into the line so that they don't have to worry about accidentally losing grip of it or losing hold of it? That's a great question. So the line is, is often tied around things or sometimes the line goes into an area that you don't want to go into. Um, we try to prohibit that. So that's, that's what's called a line trap. So when we're in a cave, we have all this gear, we have our tanks on our backs. We have our profiles basically doubled. And so it's kind of hard to judge 
your spatial orientation. So sometimes the line goes in an area that you don't want to go through the cave because it would either damage it or the line would entangle you. Um, so if you were to be constantly on that line, to clip yourself onto it would probably just create more of an entanglement hazard. Um, and a lot of times it would be physically impossible for it to really work because the line, a lot of these caves, the water moves so quickly, especially during flood seasons, that unless those lines are very securely tied onto rocks, they'll rip out. And so I've, I've heard that question a lot and it makes sense. Kind of like, you know, you're, you're free climbing, but it's not like you're going vertical or anything. You know, you're, you're, you don't have a risk of falling. It's just, you have to find the line. And usually you're in a passage big enough or small enough to where you can find it within a few minutes if you don't panic. So I think to, to clip off um, would just make things way worse. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It's, it's like almost like there needs to be a separate, more sturdy line that goes straight through the cave that you could keep as a safety line. Yeah. So surprisingly, so the line is, is about as small as we can get it without it actually just disintegrating in your hands because it's actually a huge entanglement hazard. So all of our gear has this really hooky stuff on it. Like we have knobs and clips and bolts and this and that. And like, it just seems like a magnet for the line. And so a lot of people died by just getting entangled in the line. They couldn't get out. And so to have more line in there would just make it worse. Um, surprisingly, I mean, the line is, is meant to be a visual aid. If you're physically touching the line, you better be making your way towards the exit because something's wrong. So, I mean, if, if you're, unless, I mean, you put your, you're, we're taught to not put any strain or stress on line because in reality, these lines that are in these systems have been there for decades. And that if you just give them one little tug, they're going to break. I have a question. So, what's up? Um, show us the slate you would use on an exploration dive versus the material or slate you would bring back to just do survey work? Great crest, great question, Brett. So here is a survey slate uh, put together by Matt Van Zandt. And this is what I would call an exploration grade survey slate. And this is, this is a phenomenal tool to get as much information as you possibly can in a very quick way. And the reason for that is because the particular individual that's using the slate is diving at depths between 300 and 400 feet where for every five minutes he's staying there, he's looking at about another hour of deco. So he's, he's not worried about getting the most accurate, precise shots. And plus he's in a cave that has relatively big passage and long shots. So he, to actually take the time to flip a page in a wet note is actually gonna add substantial time and danger to the dive, especially in a dive where survey isn't the primary goal, it's exploration. Um, so this would be what an example of what I would call uh, an exploration grade, uh, not necessarily quick and dirty, but just try to get as much information as you can. And what's nice is, you know, there's these little, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's little wheel things that you can turn the, the page just kind of continuously turns. And so you're not having to open and close the wet notes. And, and the guys who are diving deep at some of the really deep stuff that are doing like monumental dives and not only accomplishing great things, but collecting survey along the way, this is really the best way to do it. But when it comes to actually like, I guess, trying to get more accurate survey and have fun, you're just gonna have a standard set of wet notes, which I don't have on me right now. So um, but it's basically just a set of a notebook that waterproof paper, right in the rain paper. Hey, Does Adam. That your hey, hey, Bob, how's it going, man? Hey, not, nice to see you. I, I'm curious, cause you, you you're saying so many things that make it sound wildly inaccurate. And we both know that the radio locate is a tool to accurize the, uh, the uh, survey. Can you just kind of touch on that to at least? Yes, take, I take would love to. In fact, guys? That was actually a topic that I wanted to talk about in depth, um, but I, I nixed it. Um, so um, some of these guys who are collecting this data who who are collecting at a grade that the dry cavers would consider a lower grade, which I would consider a normal grade. They're thinking of ways to go back and just double check the state and make it more verifiable. And they do that with radio locates. So um, it's a very smart individual named Andy Pitkin um, somehow came up with this ferrite core thing. And I know, I know he adopted it from some dry cavers, but it's different because there's water and it's, it's all sciencey, sciencey stuff. But basically he's going and taking this core thing and making these uh, 
these grunts, if you will, who, who wouldn't otherwise be doing anything more constructive, like, you know, take pictures or anything, wheel this ferrite core into the cave and Andy Pitkin sits on the surface with this like circular disc thing. And he's able to tell exactly where that station is. And so that he can go back in the software and correct for that. And so when you have these very long shots, um, like in WikiWatchy, where these huge passages that just go for ages that are really deep, where you're trying to get as much information as possible, that radio locate's gonna more than make up for any deficiency in the, in the survey, or not even necessarily the survey being collected, but some of that survey is survey that's 20 years old, um, that was collected in open circuit on air or in other ways that weren't really the most efficient. But in reality, no one's ever gonna go back and redo it. So you can make up for it by doing a radio locate, which is basically just have a, a special piece of equipment. I don't even know how to explain it. Andy Pitkin could, I think he's the only one that can make it. Um, where you figure out where exactly a station is precisely on land. And then you take that coordinate and you dump it into um, compass and then it corrects for it, kind of like closing the loop. Except instead of closing the loop, you would manually change. And the soft Larry Fisher software is smart enough to correct for that over the series of stations. And it's actually really technical. He uses like um, standard deviation and probability and statistics and algorithms and behind how that corrects for it's actually way beyond my comprehension and uh it works it's it's pretty accurate he's he's made some pretty big corrections and, and able to get basically take somewhat lower grade software and make it or lower grade survey and make it uh, a lot more accurate does that answer your question bob well i i just wanted to be fair to the group that there is some accuracy in this, but yeah, that does that does kind of tie it together. Thank you. Brett, do you have another question? No, okay. Anybody else? Any other questions? This has been a great uh, discussion. I, I've got I one. I do have, oh, okay. I'll let the lens go first. Oh yeah, just real quick. So, you know, with dry cavers and passageways, you know, we have, a lot more room to sort of squeeze around and crawl and stuff when you're underwater and and if you see a passageway probably big enough just for you to get your tank through uh i don't know if there's a way you could back out of that or is that kind of a call like you don't want to go too far and get caught up in some silt or knock your tank or something or how how would you uh measure smaller passageways i guess is all i got so that, that's kind of a million dollar question a lot of people have died going into passages they couldn't get out of. And it's because they get A-framed or they get in there and they can't turn around. Their tanks jam up against the ceiling. Um, many famous cave divers have died that way. That's that's kind of, there's really no magical answer to that question. It's, it's uh, how big of a risk are you willing to take versus the reward? So, you know, if you see this very small passage and everything would indicate that it's gonna open back up into monumental passage or maybe be that, that once in a lifetime connection would make someone justify it. But for the most part, um, you know, that's really what all of exploration would have seen is left is just the small stuff because as technology advances and your gear gets smaller, people are able to wedge themselves into smaller and smaller stuff. And so to answer your question, there really is no magical answer. It's, it's comfort. I mean, there's, there's certain theories behind it, but you know, the, you know, one of the, um, quotes I heard was from Houdini is there's always slack somewhere, meaning that if your gear is slack, you could always make up for it somewhere and wiggle out. But I mean, I've been helplessly trapped and thought I was going to die and it was awful. And there's just no magical way to get out of it. It's just you got to, you got to muscle your way through it. And some people unfortunately thought that they could get through and they didn't and they got stuck and they drowned. So it's just, it's a, it's a call you have to make. Um, and if it's worth, if it's worth it. I have a question. What's up, Brett? Um, something that you've been doing lately, which I really think is great, and it shows, I like it when you haven't even surveyed a whole system. And this is something that I think in underwater cave diving has been kind of, you know, people always feel like surveys have to begin from the front and, and do this linear thing. But as a cartographer, and you do a lot more of it than I ever have, I always find people who really enjoy it and then I digress and go, good, make way. But 
you know, there's always been this thing. We got a survey from the front to the back, and I've seen a lot, th a lot of survey from you lately where you just survey something far back in the cave where it's just this one passage. And uh, tell me, explain in your own words why you can, you know, in, in caving or especially underwater caving, it's not really necessary to survey a cave from the front to the back and you can kind of break it up. Can you explain kind of your thought process on that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, I think touching on what Brett said earlier in that comment was, you know, trying to see, a, a, trying to see your survey through from start to finish. I don't know how it is in dry caving, but in, in wet caving, there is no end. There's no end of the cave. If, if there's flow, moving through the water, that means that there is cave on the other side of that flow. So if when you see a cave end, it's not end. So people have it in mind that they don't want to release a map until it's done. And so what you end up having is some of these maps that just go on for years and years and years. And some of the best maps I've ever seen in my entire life, some of the best cartographers, and some of the best maps that were ever made are maps that you'll never ever see because the cartographer was convinced that they just weren't done. And that was just the, my, one of my biggest pet peeves. And I don't want to mention who, but um, you know, some of the map of, of Madison, the map of, uh, of, of uh, Corbett and, and just these spectacular maps that only two or three people have ever seen, but because he was waiting to be done and now he's not diving anymore. So now we're never going to see him. And it's like that, that's kind of what my motivation was just to, if I'm feeling motivated to capitalize on that motivation and collect what I can when I can. And going back on the same individual, um, talking about devils, um, you know, Bob Schulte made the map of the back of devils, which is in my opinion is one of the most significant maps ever made because it's this very elusive area that many people have perished and it's a beautiful area. It's, it's taboo. It's just, but he ended it. He said, I'm going to start here and I'm going to end here. And he didn't even really pick a subjective place. It wasn't really tying in anyone else's map. He just decided what was important versus not important. And I think more people find value in that map than any other map that goes from the entrance out to it. So um, I think it's, a lot of the, to answer Brett's question, a lot of it has to do with my ADD. And if I just feel compelled to sketch in one particular area, I will. Um, but the nice thing about having guideline is you could leave a marker in place. And you, when you feel motivated to, to survey out the next time, you can come back and you know exactly where you were. Um, and I think people just get so hung up on having a start to finish map. Um, when in reality, people just want to know what's happening in a particular area of cave and they can find value in that. So. Um, it's also nice from team to team where if one team wants to survey one section of the cave, another wants to survey another, and the, the gap between the teams going in are going to be years, you can leave a marker in place at a significant area. And usually that, and that's what we're doing right now, where if we have time to survey before conditions turn crap, survey as much as we can in an area that we want to survey because we're motivated. And maybe next year we'll be motivated to survey somewhere else. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I see it. Awesome. I think we had another question. There you go. Go ahead, man. It's just one. Uh, probably not some questions, but maybe ask for your suggestions. So if you find, well, I actually saw one. So it's like a big hall, like in Eagle Nest, Adam. But uh, the visibility is really bad. Like I probably see 10, 15 foot in front of me. So with that kind of built uh, huge passage that you can see from wall to walls or from ceiling to the bottom if we have to survey that would you stick with the just the ceiling or are you going to go straight from the light that stay on the wall on the side wall what would be your suggestion to do the survey i've, I've so i'll use lafayette as an example lafayette is one of the largest okay. caves and you can't you can never see it. it's the it's the most beautiful cave system you'll never see because visibility at best is 20 to 30, but the passages are at times 100 foot wide and like Eagle's Nest. So you kind of have to adopt from cave to cave and what you're trying to accomplish. So what you're saying, like with Eagle's Nest, um, I knew a guy who went in there and just went to the top of the mound and ran line in just various directions. And he surveyed that line to the wall. And so now he has a plot of just the room. And then he ran a line around the edge of the wall and then sketched to the left of that. And he did that in like 10 or 20 foot of visibility. I was able to come up with a very accurate map, very detailed map, based because he saw, okay, this rock is five feet from this line. I know this line is right here on this survey, so that must be right here on my plot. And he just did that meticulously and swooped back and forth and basically just sketched and surveyed by feel. And if you're willing to take enough time to do that, 
especially if you have a bunch of time to burn at Deco and you have nothing else better to do, um, you're going with something really accurate. So um, when surveying in, in low vis caves, um, you usually have to use a tape measure to run up the wall because there's no way you can guess, especially if there's flow. I mean, usually high, high, usually low flow caves have high flow. And so if you're just to swim straight to the wall, your spatial orientation is going to be so screwed up, it won't be accurate at all. So, so you just have to tape it out or run a line to it and then take a shot at that line. But that takes time. And that's why a lot of these low fizz caves, you, you don't see anything better than stick maps. Gotcha. Thank you, Adam. Awesome. Anybody else? Any other questions tonight? This has been great. Adam, if you want to, I think you can stop sharing your screen and we can get the view of everyone. Um, if there are no other questions, Jim, I will have you go ahead and stop uh, the recording for this evening.